Good evening, everybody. And a very, very warm welcome on behalf of Parzor and India International Center. Our eminent speaker this evening honestly requires no introduction. Senior Justice at the highest court in our land, the Supreme Court, former Solicitor General of India, and before that, Counsel Extraordinaire. However, this evening I don't wish to speak of Justice Rohinton Nariman as anything connected with law. I want to speak to him as a, about him as a person. Burma Nirani last week very correctly said that a lot of us Parsis rest on the laurels of our ancestors saying, oh, they did this, they created that, they had so much wealth. And I totally agree because I really think the two generations or maybe three generations of Parsis are who I would consider a dead generation. However, fortunately, in my generation, I'm privileged to have a really wonderful person who is an illuminary, sorry, pardon my English, for us, and an absolutely shining light for the Parsis in Delhi. Rohinton, as very few people may know, actually has passions other than law. One of them is comparative religion and the history of the religions, and the other is music. He has also been blessed with a phenomenal photographic memory. A lot of people can have photographic memories, but what use do they put them to is really where Rohinton stands out. Rohinton glances at a page, remembers it, whether it be religion, history, autobiography, biography, anything. But the wonderful thing about him is that he actually analyzes what he read in his head. He then compares it to the same subject where he's read something before and finally gives his interpretation of it. Some of us were hugely privileged to have experienced that during his Gatha classes. And now, this evening, you will get an experience of it when he talks about the Persian history and the Achaemenian and the Sassanian empires. Forget about the rest of the world. The Parsis themselves really are useless at our heritage. We don't know where we came from. We don't know how brilliant the Persian empire was. Nothing. And I'm sure that this evening's talk is going to illuminate that for you in a very, very different way. The other thing I want to say is that Rohinton has a deep passion for music. And frankly, we would have had another Zubin Mehta in our midst had he chosen to be a conductor. And I honestly mean that. But above all, I want to say that Rohinton is a wonderful, loyal, and true friend. And I'm saying this on behalf of a dear departed friend of ours, Temul Kantinwala, whom he stood by th through thick and thin, and whom I saw him share the real meaning of friendship with. Anyway, enough of all this. Rohinton, please come on stage. Thank you, Shanaz. May I begin this by first stating how happy we are with Mrs. Shanaz Kama, who has done human service in bringing out all this and showing the glory of ancient Persia to all and sundry. My beloved parents, ladies and gentlemen, To see the world in a grain of sand and heaven in a wildflower 
to hold infinity in the palm of your hand and eternity in an hour. Thus spake William Blake. And what I have to do this evening is actually to hold eternity in the palm of, of my hand, infinity in the palm of my hand first, and then eternity in an hour, because to cover or attempt to cover two of the five great Persian empires in a single evening, in about one hour, is a, is a very, very difficult task. But I'll attempt to do my best. First, I'll give you all an outline, a broad outline, of five Persian empires that existed. The first is called the Peshdadanian and is largely mythical because we have no recorded history of any of the kings, of any of the people there. They all formed part of a book called the Khudai Nameh, which was first produced sometime in the 500 ADs under Kushru Nosherwan, and then formed the basis for the Shahname 500 years later. The second basic dynasty is the Kayanyan, and it is this, or rather to this dynasty, that Prophet Zarathustra belonged. This, again, unfortunately, we don't have in recorded history. So the first really great Persian empire of recorded history is what is called the Achaemenian. Now, Plato, as a great philosopher, told us all that his ideal of kingship would be the philosopher king. And after Plato, we have had very great, great philosopher kings. We've had Ashoka the Great here in this country in around 250 BC. We have had the age of the Antonines, which according to Will Durant was perhaps the most glorious period in history ever, where you had four great philosopher kings rule a massive empire. And the reason why it was so great was that none of them produced sons. Each appointed is heir. So you had all-time greats like Trajan, Hadrian, Antoninus, Pius, and then finally Marcus Aurelius. The magic spell was broken because Marcus Aurelius produced a son. <laughs> Apart from these great rulers, you have the Emperor Akbar here. But what is interesting is that even before Plato conceived of the philosopher king, you had arguably one of the greatest ever philosopher kings. And he is the founder of what we call the Achaemenian dynasty. He was none other than Cyrus the Great. Cyrus the Great ruled from 550 BC to 529 BC. In terms of number of years, it wasn't very great. But in terms of what he did, it would be gigantic footsteps to follow him. And again, his son failed to measure up. Cyrus the Great was born to a Persian nobleman called Cambyses, who married a lady called Mandane, who was the daughter of a ruler called Astyagis. Now, a number of these names will keep recurring. But I'm sorry, there is no way in which one can lessen the burden for you people. I'll have to keep mentioning them. Now, Astyages, the maternal grandfather, has a dream before Cyrus the Great is born. And his dream is that his daughter, Mandane, has from her a huge flood of water which floods Asia. Another dream is that from her navel, a big plant grows and again covers most of Asia. When he went to his soothsayers and asked, what does all this mean? The soothsayers said, we are afraid these are bad portents for you. Because the person who will be born or the son who will be born to your daughter will certainly oust you and become lord of Asia. So what he did was, he devised a scheme by which 
his trusted lieutenant, a man called Harpagus, and these are all Greek names, because I must tell you that most of our sources for all this are Greek sources, Roman sources, the Bible, very little in terms of actual Persian sources short of rock inscriptions, etc. So, Harpagus is given this dastardly task of destroying baby Cyrus. When baby Cyrus is born, instead of destroying him, he exchanges him for a stillborn baby and gives Cyrus away to a shepherd to bring up. Cyrus is brought up as a shepherd but could not hide his royal lineage. And when he came of age, it was obvious to all that he was a royal prince. And when Astyagis ultimately found out that, in fact, this was his grandson, he was extremely angry. And he did something which in history was so dastardly that it was difficult to record. He had Harpagus, that is his lieutenant's son, murdered and served up to Harpagus at lunch. Now, all this, of course, did not prevent Cyrus from fulfilling his destiny. So as predicted, one of the first things that he did was to upset his grandfather from the throne and then began his glorious career of campaigns. Now his campaigns took him northwards, southwards, eastwards, westwards. And therefore the first empire that was laid down by Cyrus the Great was indeed a massive empire, only made all the greater by Darius the first or Darius the Great. Now two interesting campaigns took place. First, the Lydian campaign. Now Lydia is part or is really Turkey plus, modern day Turkey plus. And it was ruled at that time by a king called Croesus. Now Croesus, all of you must remember, was known for his wealth. And an Athenian lawgiver called Solon was going across Croesus's lands and went and met and paid obeisance to the king. So the king asked Chris, uh, Solon, who according to you is the happiest man alive? Solon gave some answer, said there's some Athenian that he knew and he was happy for reason X. He asked the same question again to which he got an even more strange reply. Finally, the king burst out and said, can you not see I am the happiest man alive? Solon's answer was, call no man happy till he is dead. And Solon went on. Now Croesus consulted the Delphic oracle. In those days there was an oracle at a place called Delphi in Greece and asked the oracle, that if he were to march out on a conquest, what would happen? And the oracle gave a typical oracular pronouncement, which was that if you march out, a great empire will be destroyed. Another answer given to Croesus when he asked that, is it possible for somebody to conquer me? The answer given was equally puzzling. Answer was, not until a mule sits upon the throne. Now, both oracular pronouncements came correct. The first pronouncement was correct because a great empire was indeed destroyed, Croesus' his own. The second also came correct because Cyrus was considered a mule. Why was he a mule? He was the product of a horse and a donkey, namely... He was the product of a Persian, an Amid. And unfortunately, therefore, for Croesus, Cyrus's campaign against Croesus proved successful. In the beginning, it was very difficult for Cyrus because Sardis, that is Croesus's ancient capital, was a place which was almost impregnable, something like Constantinople, when Muhammad the Conqueror attempted to breach its walls in 1453 AD, long, long after. 
as you all probably know, he had the largest cannon ever built by some Hungarian called Urban. And even that cannon could not breach Constantinople's walls. And ultimately, it just so happened that a small gate at the side called Kerka Porta was in inadvertently left open as a result of which some of his soldiers thinking that there's a trap went in and actually found that the gate was unmanned and that is how Constantinople fell. Pretty like Constantinople falling was the fall of Sardis because Sardis again was impregnable and after a long siege, somebody discovered that some soldier from a particular point was able to retrieve his helmet and go back in. Now the moment they saw that, they were able immediately to see that the place where he retrieved his helmet and went in happened to be the weakest point at which that particular fort could possibly be attacked. And it was so attacked and ultimately Sardis fell and with it Croesus. Now what happened was very interesting. A big funeral pyre was put up by Croesus himself and Croesus was tied to it. Before anybody could light it, Cyrus came on the scene with his troops. And just as he came, the pyre was lit. When the pyre was lit, Croesus remembered how right that Athenian was. Call no man happy till he's dead. Look at the way I'm dying. And said that to his soldiers. Cyrus asked, what is this man saying? And he was told this. Cyrus being extremely hum humble and clement by nature, said, immediately put out the fire. Everybody tried, but it wasn't possible. So, Persian soldiers and Lydian soldiers alike prayed to the Almighty that there be rain. There was rain, the fire was put out, and Croesus put down alive. Croesus, in turn, was treated by Cyrus as a great ruler and became part of his inner council later. And it was Croesus who kept advising him on his future campaigns, which again gives you some insight into what this great emperor was. Now we come to another very interesting part. And if I may at this juncture ask that the slides begin. Because... The very first slide that we have is of the Cyrus Cylinder. Now this cylinder was discovered in 1879 in, of all places, Babylon. And Babylon, you will remember, was a very powerful ancient kingdom. Now Babylon at that time was ruled over by a man called Nabonidus. And Nabonidus had his son Belshazzar actually ruling at the time that Cyrus decided to embark on the conquest of Babylon. The interesting thing that we are told about in the Cyrus Cylinder is, and by the way, it is in cuneiform writing. Now, cuneiform is a particular form of script, which is an ancient Sumerian script. You'll remember the Sumerians were perhaps the first people in history to have writing. And it is this script that is used on all the great rock inscriptions of the Achaemenians. However, though the script is the same, the language here is Akkadian, which is ancient Babylonian. Now, the Cyrus Cylinder tells us that King Cyrus came and bowed to the Babylonian god Marduk. This is very important. His bowing to the god Marduk signified that he came not as a conqueror but as a liberator. Nabonidus and his whole tribe worshipped different gods and brought them over to Babylon and forced the Babylonians to bow to their god. Cyrus therefore declares here that I bow to you, O Marduk. I seek your blessings for both me and my son, Cambyses. And 
I wish to declare that I have really come here not as a conqueror, but as a liberator. Now, interestingly enough, Babylon again was impregnable. And one side of the city had no wall because the Euphrates River acted as a wall or as a barrier. Somehow or the other, Cyrus was able to divert the Euphrates overnight. He was obviously a military genius. And the next morning was able to walk, virtually walk into Babylon. Interestingly, apart from this source about Cyrus, the other source about the great King Cyrus will be found in the Old Testament of the Bible. The Bible contains five books in the Old Testament which deal with Achaemenian history. One of them we will deal with when we come to King Xerxes and the entirety of the book is devoted to Xerxes. The other four books deal with King Cyrus and they are the 15th which is Ezra, 16th Nehemiah, 17th Isaiah that is the second Isaiah that is chapter 45 onwards and ultimately Daniel which is book 27. And it is to Daniel that we come immediately because on the night before Cyrus entered Babylon, you had Belshazzar, who was the crown prince, feasting away, carousing away, when suddenly all this gets interrupted. And on the wall across him, we have a hand which mysteriously appears and writes in red, Mene, Mene, Tekel, Uparsin, which means... You have been found, you have been weighed in the scales and you have been found wanting. As a result of which, a foreign conqueror will come and finish you. And that is exactly what happened on the following day. So we have, apart from the Lydian conquest, the Babylonian conquest. And the UN apparently has as the earliest possible declaration of human rights, what is stated on this cylinder, that here you have an arguably Zoroastrian king who comes and bows to another person's gods and says specifically that I have come here not as a conqueror but as a liberator. Another great thing that he did was to free the Jews who were captured a little earlier and sent to Babylon as slaves. Now not only did he free the Jews, he also issued a royal decree in which he said that I will have your temple rebuilt. Because if you remember, Solomon's temple which was built about 450 years before was destroyed by a Babylonian king. The Bible says it was Nebuchadnezzar. And this decree was actually fished out in Darius's time and the temple rebuilt with Persian funds. A very interesting postscript. After Titus's conquest of Jerusalem in 70 AD, all that remained of that old temple and then Herod's temple was this one outer wall, which is called the Wailing Wall. If you look at the Wailing Wall closely, you will find it is made, there is actually an ancient wall which is the wall from the ground up by about four or five feet, and on top of it, Herod's wall. The ancient wall is the wall that was built in Darius's time with Persian funds. We now, therefore, move on to Cyrus's death, and it happened in a very strange way. Apparently, he had to cross a river and accost a tribe called the Massageti. And this tribe called the Massageti happened to be ruled by a queen called Tomiris. She sent her son over as an ambassador. And while the Persian soldiers were carousing with him, he got drunk and unfortunately was killed. The result was that the queen took an oath and said that you have killed my son. I will not only kill you, but I will so deface you that nobody will be able to recognize you after you are dead. And unfortunately, exactly that happened. 
Croesus, you will remember, who was the king of Lydia that he defeated, as part of his inner council, advised him not to go for this pointless war against this pointless tribe. But Cyrus didn't listen and unfortunately was killed in the battle with the Massageti. And the queen carried out her horrible promise. Now, if you move on to the next slide, you will find that at his capital, a place called Pasargade, his tomb still exists. You see the cuneiform writing here. The cuneiform writing tells you, O oh, weary traveller, I am Cyrus, king of Anshan, king of the Parsas. Do not grudge me this little piece of earth. The humility of this man stands out in stark contrast with some of his successors. And it is said by Aryan that when Cyrus saw this and was told what it meant, he wept like a child. When Alexander saw this, he wept as a, like a child. If you, you carry on, uh, you will find that the first, just go back to the earlier, you will find that the first part somehow is missing here. Oh, weary traveller. Because that's the most interesting part. And then it says, there me not there for this little piece of earth. We can now move on to the next ruler who happened to be, as I told you, Cyrus' son. He was a man called Cambyses, named after Cyrus' father. And this man apparently was exotic. He was so exotic that he had a corrupt judge flayed alive and had his skin put onto the judgment seat and had that person's son sit on it to deliver judgment. Something like Muhammad bin Tughlaq here, if you remember another extremely quixotic ruler, and Muhammad bin Tughlaq was once sued by one of his Hindu subjects for having killed his son. And the Hindu subject had the temerity to ask for damages from the ruler. So it went before the court of the Qazi. And Muhammad bin Tughlaq, being apprised of this, actually appeared before the court of the Qazi. The Qazi got up for the emperor. The emperor said, sit down or I'll have you flayed alive on the spot. You are a judge and I am a suitor before you. You will decide this case strictly in accordance with law. And ultimately the Qazi awarded damages and Muhammad bin Tughlaq paid them. But coming back to Cambyses, we find that apart from this quixotic nature, he added one very important province to the Persian Empire, which was Egypt. Because at the Battle of Pelusium in 525 BC, he managed to defeat the pharaoh at that time, a man called Sameticus. And it is said by Herodotus, who hated him, that he slew the Apis bull. Now, who is the Apis bull? The Apis bull is a bull required ceremonially for various Egyptian rites. And the bull has insignia upon it which do not appear on other common bulls. It is black first. It has a white spot on its head. And it has various other insignia such as a scarab on its tongue, etc. Now, unfortunately for Herodotus, who said that Cambyses in a mad fit went and slew the bull, we have in fact a stone tablet which tells us that he only wounded the bull. He didn't kill him. And the bull happened to live on until the fourth year of the reign of Darius. But apart from the conquest of Egypt and apart from his quixotic behavior, he didn't rule for very long. He also did one or two other things which were pretty ghastly. He had a younger brother called Bardia, who unfortunately he put to death. And while returning from the campaign in Egypt, he was told of a particular defeat and as a result committed suicide. 
So that is how Cambyses went. After Cambyses, the throne was up for grabs. And now we come to the one of the greatest other rulers of this dynasty, the great Darius, Darius the first. Now, Darius, in this great rock inscription, which is called the Behistun inscription, tells us that he was the ninth in a series of rulers, beginning with Achaemenes. Now, because it begins with Achaemenes, the entire dynasty is called the Achaemenian dynasty. He tells us he is number nine. And he also tells us that he came to the throne by first slaying a usurper called Gaumata. Now, Gaumata apparently was a Magian. And you see somebody under Cyrus's foot. That is Gaumata. I'm, I'm sorry, under Darius's foot. That is Gaumata. Now, Gaumata apparently impersonated Bardia, who was Cambyses' dead brother, until he was found out and destroyed by Darius and six other friends of Darius. He also tells us that he had to put down a series of rebellions. And you see all the rebellious chiefs standing before him. And it is only after four years that he was able to actually reign over an empire, which he increased very greatly. It is under him that the empire actually went right up to the river Indus. So that we had the Pakistani part of Punjab ruled by the Achaemenians for about 200 odd years. Interestingly enough, we also find contingents of Indian soldiers fighting under both King Xerxes in his Greek wars and under Darius III against Alexander. Now, it is because this man was able to vastly expand the empire that the Achaemenian empire really came to the forefront in the ancient world and became the largest single empire. It stretched from the Indus this side right up to the Mediterranean and from the Caspian Sea in the north right up to the Red Sea in the south. A little more about the rock inscription. You will find above Darius, Ahura Mazda. That is God in Zoroastrianism. Ahura Mazda, according to Darius, was the one great creator God by whose blessings he ruled. There's a very beautiful inscription, which we don't have here, unfortunately, but which is on the palace walls at Persepolis, which says that I worship Ahura Mazda, I, Darius, worship Ahura Mazda, who created the earth and the sky and man and happiness for man. Beautiful. This inscription, by the way, is trilingual. It is in three languages, but all in the cuneiform script. The first language is the spoken language, the old spoken language, Avesta, which is an exact sister of the Rigvedic Sanskrit. The second is Elamite, which was a spoken language of the day in a neighboring district called Elam and the third Babylonian, Akkadian. Now it took an Englishman, a man called Sir Henry Rawlinson, a number of years with considerable risk to his life to go up here and copy everything that was written. And ultimately, he was able to crack the code. And in 1837, for the first time, he cracked the Avestan code. And 1843, he was able to translate the Elamite part and the Akkadian part because it was realized that all three inscriptions said exactly the same thing. Incidentally, Ashoka's rock edicts, which came shortly after, and the Rosetta Stone, which you see in the British Museum, all copied this form of writing something. Ashoka also had bilingual inscriptions and he had them in Kharoshti, he had them in Brahmi, all of course speaking in the Prakrit language. And apart from Ashoka, 
Ptolemy the fifth said pretty much what he wanted to on the Rosetta Stone, again which was trilingual. This time with Egyptian hieroglyphs on top, another Egyptian language called Demotic below it, and then a third language which was Greek. Now, each of these great rock inscriptions were deciphered within about 20 years of each other. And you had remarkable people who did them. Champollion, a Frenchman, was able to decipher ancient Egyptian hieroglyph sometime in 1822. And we have a, another Englishman called James Princep who happened to decipher the Ashokan bilingual and lingual inscriptions. Uh, sometime in the 1840s. So within about 20 years of each other, suddenly a number of dead languages came alive and history that was completely dead to the world also came alive with them. Now, this inscription, interestingly, tells us that Darius says that he put down the rebellions that ultimately he was able to rule because he put Gaumata down and then goes on to say that I had conquest after conquest. But there are two very interesting things that he says. One, that I am not telling you, in fact, I am telling you a fraction of the things that I have done. Because if I were in fact to tell you what I have done, you will think I am a liar. And secondly, he also says that a curse is upon those who do not protect this inscription and a greater curse on those who try to destroy it. Ultimately, the inscription ends with saying that he conquered many lands and only in the lands in which there was no God did he introduce Ahura Mazda there. Now, apart from this inscription, you come to the other great phase of Darius's life which are the Greek wars. Now, one of the reasons why Persian history has unfortunately been hidden from the Western world and consequently to us is because the Greeks were able to stave off the Persian invasion. Apparently, Athens, which had been conquered by him, revolted. And when it revolted, Darius had told the person who woke him up every morning to tell him, Sire, do not forget the Athenian revolt. Something like Napoleon being woken up every morning and being told, Sire, you have great things to do today. Now, Darius never forgot that revolt. And with his, the, all the might at his command, went at Athens, and you all know that in 490 BC, the great battle of Marathon took place, where a very few number of Greeks on the beachhead at Marathon, 9,000, were able to stave off a huge Persian army, and thus stave off rebellion. Now, Darius therefore, in turn, died in 485 BC, without somehow being able to deal with uh, the, the Greeks. If we may move on to the next slide. This is Darius's palace at Persepolis, which you all must be reasonably familiar with. Next slide, please. This is a painting done of the same palace. And with this, we move on to the next great ruler, of the Achaemenian dynasty, Xerxes. Now, an entire book of the Bible is devoted to Xerxes. This book, the book of Esther. And the book of Esther runs thus. First and foremost, Esther is a Persian name. It is not a Jewish name. And the lady called Esther had a Jewish name called Hadassah. She happened to be the niece of a Jew called Mordecai. And Mordecai was serving in Xerxes' court. The book of Esther begins with Xerxes being disenchanted with his queen, a name called Vasti. 
as a result of which Mordecai, who was the Jew in the palace, introduced his niece Esther to the great king. Meanwhile, you had a person called Haman who was an Amalekite. Now, Amalekites are traditional enemies of the Jews. And Haman, because Mordecai the Jew would not bow before him, somehow or the other got to Xerxes and was able to tell Xerxes that, look, you must do something about these troublesome people because not only do they not bow to you, they do not bow to God Almighty as well. And therefore, you must destroy them. So a royal decree was sent out stating that on the 13th of Adar, please remember the month, the month was called Adar in the Bible, of a particular year, the Jews will have to be decimated because of their rebellious behavior. Now, all this was known to Mordecai and therefore consequently to Esther. Somehow or the other, Esther enters the king's affections. And when she enters the affections of the king, Mordecai at the same time reveals a plot to murder Xerxes. So Xerxes somehow softens to the two of them and ultimately is told that Haman has given him a tissue of lies about their people. Their people are very God-fearing. Their people are people who will follow him, etc. So, the famous expression, the laws of the Medes and the Persians occurs here. Now, under the laws of the Medes and the, Medes and the Persians, the moment a decree is sent out, you cannot countermand it. The only way of countermanding it is to send another cross decree. So, a cross decree was therefore sent in which it was stated that the Jews will be better armed than the soldiery who are supposed to finish them. And thanks to that cross decree, ultimately, the Jews on that 13th of order, of order had a tremendous slaughter of all their enemies instead of the other way around, which they celebrate till today as the great feast of Purim. And that's celebrated every year in Israel, even today. Now, all this is told to us in this book of Esther. The only source of information about this aspect of Xerxes is the book of Esther. And you will see Ahusaurus is none other than Xerxes in the Bible. If you move on, please, to the next, you will find here what is called the famous Daiva inscription. This is to show that Xerxes was monotheistic, worshipped only one creator god, and therefore railed against the worship of Daivas or many gods or what he called false gods. We also find that Xerxes had his own campaigns in the Greek wars, which again led to great disaster. Now, Xerxes followed upon his father's defeat in Marathon, and the next battle that was fought was fought with the Spartans. And there's a small group of Spartans who, about 300 of them, who unfortunately, because of a traitor, were cut down to the last man, despite great bravery, at the Battle of Thermopylae, which is the only battle that the Persians succeeded in, in the Greek wars. Now, after Thermopylae came another very great battle in 480 BC, which is the Battle of Salamis. Salamis was a sea battle. And interestingly enough, when Xerxes first went over from the mainland to the Hellespont, which is to the Greek mainland, there was such a storm that he got repulsed. When he got repulsed, apparently, he was so angry with the, with the water god that he had the water lashed 300 times. <laughs> and it is after this that he went for his Greek war. Now, this brings to mind another great ruler, King Canute, Canute, of course, was long, long after Xerxes, a Danish king who also ruled England, 
who did exactly the opposite thing. If you remember, his throne was put into the water when the tide was rising. And with all his courtiers fawning over him, he commanded the waves to go back. They only came forth instead of going back. And then he turned to them and said, See, I have no dominion over the forces of nature. Who am I? I am a humble, small human being. But unfortunately, Xerxes was the opposite. And Xerxes had the mortification of actually watching the sea battle of Salamis from a promontory on top. Interestingly enough, an Athenian called Themistocles was the person who actually won the battle for the Greeks. And he won it in the following manner. What he did was, he somehow got all the vessels to go into a cul-de-sac. Now the moment that happened, the Greek vessels which were small were able to fight effectively. The Persian vessels which were big and unwieldy were not. And they got trapped in this cul-de-sac. And as a result of getting trapped, Xerxes lost, lost the Battle of Salamis. And after losing the Battle of Salamis, the next thing that happened was that they had a land battle at Placia in 479 BC, which was also lost, despite great bravery by the Persian soldiers. And it was after this that once and for all, the Persians were expelled completely from the Greek homelands. And it is because this happened that the history that I am narrating to you and the history that is to come was hidden completely from the Western world and consequently to all of us. We now come to the next great freeze and accordingly the next great ruler who was called Artaxerxes I. Now, for Artaxerxes I also, we have the Bible as a primary source. And here it is the book of Nehemiah, because we are told that somebody went to Artaxerxes and requested Artaxerxes to rebuild the walls of Jerusalem, which was accordingly apparently done. And therefore, the Jews praised him as a very great ruler. He was called Longimanus which basically means one hand is longer than the other. So the Greek historians, therefore, Xenophon, etc., to distinguish him from the other Artaxerxes called him Longimanus. And he apparently had a long reign, but a rather uneventful one, for the reason that ultimately he made peace with the Greeks and died 41 years later leaving a son who ruled for a very short time as Xerxes II in 425 uh, BC. And Xerxes II in turn left a son known to history as Darius the Bastard, Darius Nothus. Now, if you please turn to the next inscription, you will find the tombs of some of these kings, Darius Nothus, Artaxerxes I, etc. Now, other great bastards in history which come to mind are William the Conqueror. All of you, all of you know, have heard of him. Sargon the Great, the Assyrian. And of course, the greatest genius or perhaps arguably one of the greatest is genius ever, Leonardo da Vinci. Uh, another one that comes to mind is Confucius. But this man didn't do very much. He had a 20-year rule. And in that 20-year rule, there was a revolt of a son-in-law which was put down rather ruthlessly. This is about all we know about this ruler, which is not very much. Now, after him, we have the longest ruling uh, king of this dynasty, a man called Artaxerxes II, Artaxerxes Neman to history. Neman means thoughtful, wise. It is during his reign that we have Mithraism being born as a religion, a Persian religion. Now, Mithra, as most of you know, was considered a great god in the Rigvedic pantheon. 
all these great gods other than Ahura Mazda were thrown over by Prophet Zarathustra, who said, we have only one creator god and none of the others. So these crept back into Zoroastrianism, this time not as gods, but as angels, as Yazatas, which is why you have Parsis today praying the Khorshed and Meher Nyais. The Meher Nyais is to Mitra, or the Mitra Yast, again to Mitra. And Mitraism became such a powerful force, particularly in the next empire, in the Parthian Empire, that it actually rivaled Christianity. And Mitraism, therefore, is something which left its imprint on Christianity in many ways. One most obvious way is Christ's birthday. You will find that everybody celebrates Christmas. Was it Christ's birthday? Apparently not. The reason was, as the Bible tells us, that Jesus was a summer baby. Because we are told that when shepherds tend their flocks by night, the Savior was born. Shepherds do not tend their flocks by night in Israel at any time other than the summer months. So how was Jesus said to be born on December the 25th? It appears that in both the old Persian empire of the Achaemenians, then the Parthians, and as a result, Mitraism creeping to the Romans, that Mitra became a very great god in the Roman pantheon as well. And when he became this great god in the Roman pantheon, Mitra being the sun would be at its lowest on 25th December or thereabouts. And therefore, annually, his birthday was commemorated on 25th December by the Romans. And when Constantine the Great comes in and finally declares Christianity to be the religion of the empire, this particular feast of Mitra had necessarily to be replaced. And how do you replace it? It's something like Diwali today. How do you replace Diwali with something else? So it was replaced stating that now it is no longer Mitra's birthday, but Jesus' birthday. We also have Mitra having 12 apostles, the 12 constellations. We also have, apart from his being born from a rock, another theory that he is born of a virgin, just like Jesus. And the Eucharist, which is again a very important Christian ritual, which is the bread and wine ritual, which is nothing but the body and blood of Christ, was apparently a ritual carried out in Mithraism when the bull was slayed. And when the bull was slayed apparently because of its slaying, the blood that emanated from it fertilized the earth and therefore gave rise to civilization. So you will see that a large number of the early churches' rituals actually had to supplant Mithraism because it had such a strong foothold in the Roman world. So this Artaxerxes II, the longest reigning, reigning monarch, had introduced in a big way temples to Mitra and temples again to a fertility of water goddess, Anaita. After him, you come to another ruler called Artaxerxes III. Now, Artaxerxes III again is known for repeating Cambyses' fate of slaying the Apis bull when he reconquered Egypt. And it is in his time that one of the seven ancient wonders of the world was built. I wonder if you people know about the ancient wonders of the world. Three of them were Greek temples. One of them was the lighthouse at Pharos. The most ancient of the lot, of course, were the pyramids which still exist. Otherwise, all the others have gone in history. Colossus of Rhodes went within 60 years. But the wonder that I am speaking about is the mausoleum of a place of a person called Mausolus, who was a satrap of this king, Artaxerxes III. 
and it was at a place called Helicarnassus. Helicarnassus is in Turkey and is the place from which Herodotus, who wrote his histories, came from. Now, with Artaxerxes III, we pretty much come to an end of this dynasty. May we have the next slide? And we find now the last ruler, Darius III, he had a short reign and unfortunately for him, he had to face the greatest conqueror the world has ever known, Alexander. Unfortunately for him again, despite a flurry of letters between the two, where they both abused each other, one letter began with, oh, you beardless youth, who are you to try and challenge the might of this empire? With Alexander writing back, and saying, the proof of the pudding is in the eating, come and face me in the field. And ultimately, two great battles, Isis and Gaugamela, in about 331 BC, the entire edifice of this great empire came crashing down. You all know that Alexander, in a drunken fit, burned Persepolis, burned a lot of Western literature, and all that because of courtesan called Thais told him, do not forget the torching of Athens by Xerxes. So it was done in retaliation for the torching of, of Athens by King Xerxes, which in turn was done for the torching of Sardis, which was part of Lydia, by the Greeks. So unfortunately, this dynasty with its ten rulers comes to an end with Alexander's conquest. Post-Alexander, you have Seleucus Nicator, who is, if you may go to the next freeze, and Seleucus Nicator ruled for a short while, his son and his grandson also ruled for a very short while, which brings in then the Parthian Empire. Now, for want of time, it is not possible for, for me to tell you about this empire. This empire again spanned 500 years. I can only tell you that it is because of the Parthians that the Roman Empire never came east of the Tigris River. All of you know that the Tigris and the Euphrates are in modern-day Iraq, so that Never once were they allowed to cross this, only because Parthian horsemen were the greatest, apparently, cavalry in the world at the time. And you will find that at the Battle of Karai, which is spoken of here, you had a man called Crassus, who had put down the Spartacus revolt. All of you will remember that Spartacus was a slave whose revolt this man put down because he was one of the three major triumvirs. It, at that time, it was Caesar, Pompey, and Crassus. And while Caesar and Pompey concentrated on the west, Crassus went with a number of Roman legions to the east and attempted to conquer Parthia. He failed miserably and was repulsed at this battle where both he and his son were slain. May we have the next, please? This again tells you about Crassus and his defeat, after which we now come to the next great empire that I have promised to speak about. I am exhausted and weary. I don't know whether you are. <laughs> but this again is an empire which has something like 48 rulers. Now, it's impossible in the space of half an hour to speak about all these people. Fortunately, about 10 of them spanned about six years. So 10 of them are inconsequential to history. But otherwise, it is again a great revival of the Zoroastrian religion, which, which was really based in Iran and never really went outside Iran, except to Armenia, where there were forced conversions, as a result of which the Armenians became Nestorian Christians. But the founder of this dynasty was a man called Adeshar Papakan. Now, why Papakan? Because his father's name was Papak. Why Sasanian? Because 
he was apparently descended from a shepherd called Sasan. Why that shepherd was the person who apparently gave this dynasty its name is a mystery to all and sundry. Now, Adeshar Papakan was a person who again defeated the last Parthian ruler, a man called Ardavan, married his daughter, something like Henry VII in England. If you remember and you know English history, you will find that after a very long Plantagenet reign, in 1485, the last Plantagenet king, Richard III, is finished at the Battle of Bosworth Field. And Henry VII founds a new Welsh dynasty. What does he do? He promptly marries Elizabeth, who is the daughter of none other than Edward V, who was the last real ruler of the earlier dynasty. Similarly, this Adeshar marries the daughter of Ardavan and produces one of the greatest rulers of this dynasty, namely Shapur I, who will come to presently. But what is interesting is that this man caused a complete revival of the Zoroastrian religion. And it is in his time that we have a very interesting book called the Arda Viraf Name written. Now, Arda Viraf was a priest. And there were some seven priests who sat in a, in a conclave and ultimately, one, have, one of them had to be selected. And selected for what? Selected to leave his body and go into the other world so that he was able to describe heaven and hell to mankind. So what happened was, Ardhaviraf out of the seven priests was finally selected. And he takes an intoxicant. And having taken the intoxicant, departs from his body. Interestingly, he is accompanied by Sarosh and Rasna. Now, Sarosh and Rasna are supposed to be the two angels who accompany every corpse. Because the moment somebody dies and your mind, so to speak, or your soul leaves your body, it is Sarosh and Rasna who take you to Chinvatpun, which is the bridge of the separator. So, Sarosh and Rasna take Arda Viraf upwards. And the first thing they take him to, interestingly enough, is purgatory. Dante, when he wrote his Divine Comedy, many, many hundreds of years later, seemed to have been influenced by this work. Of course, in Dante's work, you go to the inferno immediately, you step down to hell. But here, Arda Vira first went to purgatory. And when he went to purgatory, he found all the souls there reasonably happy, except for one thing, that they experienced cold and heat. Now, why did they do this? They did this because, apparently, their good deeds and their evil deeds were balanced. And as a result of their good and evil being balanced, the only punishment inflicted upon them was that you will feel cold and heat. Otherwise, you'll be all right. From purgatory... He carries on to the four heavens, the heaven of the good thought, heaven of the good word, the heaven of the good deed. He finds the angels there, he finds good souls there, he finds people happy, content, and ultimately goes to the ultimate heaven where he actually sees Aura Mazda himself. Now what does he see? He sees a light and he hears Aura Mazda. And therefore assumes that this is God Almighty. And comes down and tells us this. Similarly, after this, the same Sarosh and Rashna take him down to the nether regions. And terrible horrors are described for all sorts of mendicants, sinners, liars, thieves, criminals, etc. And these lurid details are given right till ultimately... He actually comes across the embodiment of evil himself, Ariman. And finally, he is brought back. And all this happens after seven days and nights. So that when he is brought back, he comes and he relates all this. And all this is put down in what is called the Arda Viraf Name, 
done at the time of this first ruler of the Sasanian dynasty. Now, this man again had several wars with the Romans, reasonably successfully. It was at his time that Armenia got annexed. And he came across with a couple of very interesting sayings. One saying was that you, can, you cannot wield power as a king without an army. You cannot have an army without money. You cannot have money without agriculture. And you cannot have agriculture without justice. It's very interesting. Because unless you are just to the peasant, if you tax him too much, you will cut the hand that feeds. So this was one of the interesting sayings. Another very interesting saying was that religion and kingship are two wheels of a chariot. Unless kingship or earthly power is tempered by religion, the chariot will not move forward. This man ruled for about 18 years, being the founder of the dynasty, and left Shapur number one. Shapur number one was born of Ardavan's daughter. So therefore, he was like Henry VIII. He, his lineage went back to the old Parthian dynasty as well. It is he who really had the most successful campaigns against the Romans. Now, there were two of them. The first of them took place in 244 AD, where he was able to defeat a Roman emperor called Gordian III. After that, an emperor called Julius Philippus, who came in, made a humiliating peace with him because he ceded most of the Roman territory to the Persians. And after Julius Philippus went, there was another second campaign, this time against the emperor Valerian. And in 260 AD, not only did he defeat Valerian, but he actually brought him home to Tezifan, which was their capital at that time, and had him bound in chains. And poor Valerian died as a result. Now all this you will find, if you please turn, Yes. Just turn back, please. One. Yeah. Now, apparently, this particular bas relief that you see is Shapur I sitting on a charger. And you find Valerian and Julius Philippus in front of him. You see somebody kneeling. They are both Roman emperors. And the person at the back is his chief priest, Karthir who is looking on like this and encouraging him. You find that this then tells you as to how great this emperor was in terms of conquest. But he made one fatal mistake. He did not make friends with the ruler of a place called Palmyra. Now Palmyra is in the news today because ISIS is blowing things up there. Palmyra at that particular point of time was ruled by somebody called Odenathus. Now Odenathus had a queen called Zenobia. I don't know why Zenobia is a common Parsi name. Because this Zenobia was a direct descendant of Cleopatra. And she was one of the great warrior queens known to history. Apparently Shapur was not able to deal with either Odenathus or Zenobia. Zenobia had to be dealt with by a Roman emperor called Aurelia, who finally defeated her. But all in all, this king who called himself king of the lands of Iran and non-Iran, that is outside Iran as well, really set the Sasanian Empire to be one of the really great Persian empires and the only bulwark against the Roman Empire in those days. From this, we come now to Shapur the first uh, three sons. Now, each one of those three sons became emperors in turn. You had Hormuz one, you had Behram one, and then you had Narsir. You also had Behram two and three, who were son and grandson of Behram one. 
But interestingly enough, at this time arose another religion. The prophet was a man called Mani, M-A-N-I. And Mani basically stated that he was now something like Prophet Muhammad, the seal of the prophets, the last. Nobody is going to come after him. He tried to synthesize Zoroastrianism at that time, Buddhism and Christianity. And the potpourri that he made was that we will retain Zoroastrian dualistic principles but then twist them. And how do we twist them? We say everything on earth is dark and everything other than this earth is light. Exact opposite, inversion of Zoroastrianism. And apparently this man who was lame had such a sway over people, he was a great preacher, that he founded a religion which went on right into the 14th, 15th century. You had Manichaeanism in the form of Gnostic Christians, then Manichaeans in the form of Cathars, Albigensians in Europe, and many other offshoots. In fact, Augustine, one of the great church fathers, confesses that he was a Manichaean, he was a follower of this prophet, until he saw the light and became a Christian. Now, Mani was encouraged by Shapur I, but ultimately put to death by Pehram I, one of his sons. And not only was he put to death, his corpse apparently was hung on the gate at a city called Gundi Shapur for everyone to see so that there would be no other threat to the great religion. Now, after these three rulers, and the last, as I told you, was a son of Shapur, one called Narse. Narse basically had Roman wars, losing what his grandfather won, Armenia, and as a result, abdicating in favor of his son, Hormuz II. Hormuz too rules again for a short while and is known basically for two things. Building and having courts, and this is very interesting, where the poor were encouraged to sue the rich. So he was obviously again a person whose heart was in the right place, but he didn't last much. It is his son Shapur II that becomes again one of the brightest lights of this great dynasty. Now, Shapur II, and you'll see his bust here, was perhaps the only emperor in history to have been crowned in utero. He was crowned in his mother's stomach. How was this done? Apparently, when his father died, he was three months in his mother's stomach. And two older brothers were passed over as being unfit, one being too Romanized and one being unfit. A Zoroastrian Magus, apparently, after consulting the stars, and don't forget, the Zoroastrian Magi were master astrologers. The three so-called wise men were really Magi who came, followed some star and predicted Christ's birth and blessed him in the cradle. These very people basically predicted that this child would be a son first and that he'd be one of the greatest rulers ever. And so it, it turned out. After he was crowned in utero, there was a regency which took over for some 15 years. And the moment he turned 15, he actually then ruled a very vast empire and carried on for about 55 years. It is in his time that you have the famous Roman wars, particularly, particularly with people like Julian the Apostate and others. He again wins back everything that great-grandfather Narsay lost and again becomes a very important bulwark against the Roman Empire. Now, one other name by which he was known, interestingly enough, is Zulaktaf. Could you go to the next, please? And the reason why he is called Zulaktaf is because when he defeated the Arabs in 325, he had their prisoners pierced through the shoulders. So he was called Zulaktaf as somebody who pierces his prisoners through their shoulders. 
if you could turn over to the next release, please. After this great ruler, we had two rulers again of little consequence. Adesha II, who was called the beneficent, ruled for a short while. Shapur III. And after Shapur III, you had a ruler called Bairam IV, who again ruled for a reasonably short while. There's not much time, so we'll pass over all these. And come now to another major ruler, Yazdegad I. The city of Yazd, which is the famous city in Persia, where most Zoroastrians happen to be even today, are named after this emperor. Now, this emperor was called the accursed or the wicked by the Zoroastrian major. Why? Because apparently he was very tolerant to the other faiths. He married the Jewish patriarch's daughter, for one. For another, he presided over the council of Seleucia in 410 AD. Now, this council was a purely Christian council. And the question was whether the Nicene Creed which was arrived at in 325 AD with Emperor Constantine presiding, should also be governing Eastern churches. Ultimately, it was decided under his guidance that yes, it should. Now, this ruler also therefore ruled for about 20 years. And interestingly enough, at this point of time, brought about a rapprochement with the Romans. So much so, that a Byzantine emperor called Arcadius actually sent his son Theodosius, who became emperor later, to be tutored by this great Persian emperor. His death again is a very peculiar thing, something like the great King Cyrus is. It is said that a white horse suddenly came out of a lake. And since nobody was ready, to go to where that horse was, the emperor went and apparently was kicked to death by that horse. Now, this may be some, some old Persian legend, but this is the only thing that we are told about his death. And with him and after him comes his son called Behram Gore. A lot of you must have heard of Behram V. Behram Gore, Gore means wild ass. Why wild ass? He was the hunter of the wild ass. And he was another emperor who fought with the Romans, ultimately defeated them, and came all the way to India, married an Indian queen, and took back with him a lot of Indian things, such as music, chess, etc. And apparently was a great proponent of science, agriculture, etc. He was again a popular ruler and much loved. It is after him that you come to Yazdegar II. Now, Yazdegar II is known for, as I told you a little earlier, the forced conversions that took place in Armenia. This is the only instance in Zoroastrian history where Zoroastrianism has been foisted upon another people. And it seems it was foisted upon another people only because, at first, the king meant well. And encouraged everybody to worship in his own faith. Christians were allowed to worship, Jews were allowed to worship, etc. But then apparently, because the Magi were a little zealous, the Jews and the Christians turned on the Magi and started burning and pillaging Zoroastrian temples. And because this happened, it seems under a royal edict, everybody was, turned, was asked in Armenia to become Zoroastrian. Of course, forced conversions never really further anybody's cause because immediately after this emperor dies, everybody who was forcibly converted went back to a form of Nestorian Christianity. Yazdegar II, like Shapur I, again left three sons, each of whom was an emperor. And one of the emperors, a man called Firoz, was around at the time that the Western Roman Empire disintegrated and then disappeared in 476 AD. His son was a man called Kavad, who is the father of the great Noshirwan A. Adil, who was the next very, very great ruler of this dynasty. Now, Kavad had two reigns. 
first a 10 year reign and then a 30 year reign which was interrupted because he became an adherent of mazdak now mazdak is another religious prophet so to speak who was perhaps the very first communist he believed in sharing women he believed in sharing property and ultimately it seems again he must have been a very powerful personality like mani he was able to preach and almost convert the emperor himself but then the zoroastrian mechai got cracking and as a result mazdak was removed and ultimately it is nashirwan e adil who had him killed and this now brings us to nashirwan e adil if you may have the next yes now he is called nashirwan e adil to history his actual name was khushru because he was such an outstanding ruler he was called the caesar of the east all of you know that julius caesar left his imprint on the sands of time and because he did so you had persons who were named after him the tsar in russia tsar is a form of caesar the kaiser in germany for example any great ruler in the east was called a khushru after this great man he again had a massive rule of about some 48 years and he was remarkable by all accounts but interestingly enough he came to the throne exactly like emperor ashoka all of you must be knowing that emperor ashoka came to the throne by killing 99 of his brothers now buddhist texts tell us that he killed 99 brothers apparently he really killed only six but that's good enough <laughs> khushru nasherwan also apparently put to death his brothers because he was a younger son but then after that like ashoka he became one of the greatest rulers ever philosophers flocked to his court people thrown out from other jurisdictions flocked to his court he encouraged science he encouraged philosophy encouraged he encouraged everything that was civilized in thought and not only was a great was he a, a remarkable ruler strength and justice apparently were his hallmarks you remember i spoke about the khudai name now the khudai name was compiled at his instance and it is only because of him that we happen to know about our first two dynasties if you remember peshda danian and kayanian which ultimately firdosi tells us about but the only source material for this was this one book compiled under him called the khudai nam one or two interesting incidents about his life are that he had a massive palace but some little square at the end of the palace which was like an isor and kept for some reason so when an ambassador came from another country and asked him why is this little square there the reply was this little square belongs to an old widow i didn't want to disturb her so this shows you that a man who actually killed his brothers and came to the throne as a result became a very clement and a very great ruler he had many sayings which are interesting one saying is that the most precious treasure that one can possibly give is to reward a generous man very interesting another great saying whenever good befalls one it seems to vanish immediately but whatever evil befalls one seems to linger on he had a council of philosophers often at his court and one of the questions he once posed and he had a grand vizier called buzirg meher now he posed all the philosophers this question what is the worst thing that you can possibly conceive of that could happen to a person the greek philosopher said if you have an imbecile old age accompanied with poverty 
couldn't think of anything worse. The Indian philosophers at the court said, suppose you have a mind that is racked with disease and a body that is racked with disease. Nothing worse. Buzurg Mehr came out with something very interesting. He said, the worst thing I can think of is to approach the end of my life without having practiced virtue. Now, this is a great eye-opener, not only to what Buzurg Mehr said, but to the entire, to the rule or the, the ethos of the time as a whole. And this emperor therefore goes down as one of the greatest of this dynasty. Incidentally, the Avestan alphabet apparently was also actually founded in his reign. Avesta, you'll remember, is a very, very old language, but it was a spoken language. The alphabet comes much later. It comes after Pahlavi, which was a much, much later language. After Kushru, you had an emperor called Hormuz the Fourth who unfortunately was blinded and then killed by his brother-in-law, who was a usurper to the throne along with a particular general. And it is his son, Kushru Parvez, the second Kushru, whose reign again is almost as remarkable as his grandfather's. Now, Kushru Parvez, Parvez means victorious, was so named because he was the greatest conqueror of this dynasty. He actually brought back the Persian Empire to its largest extent, which was the extent under Darius I. He went all the way to Jerusalem in the, in the west, actually captured part of the Holy Cross and brought it back. And apparently was a good ruler as well, apart from being a great conqueror. Until, unfortunately for him, a very great general called Heraclius ultimately got the better of him. And finally, like a great candle going out, and you'll remember that when a candle goes out, it is brightest just as it's going out. This great Sasanian ruler dies being murdered by his son. And this happened sometime in 628 AD. And this paves, paves the way for the complete destruction now of this great empire. Within a period of six years, there were ten rulers, including two of his daughters. And finally, poor Yazdegar III, like Darius III before him, comes on the throne. And Yazdegar III, as you know, ultimately got defeated by the Arabs who were the great new force now, the force of Islam, which spread westwards all over Africa and into Spain and would have spread into Europe as well had they not been defeated at the Battle of Tours in 736 AD. Yazdegat III, therefore, was the person who, like Darius III before him, presided over the ultimate fall of this great empire. And finally, he himself was murdered in 651 AD, which is the year from which our Parsi calendar begins as year one. This brings us to an end of this talk. I can't help but telling you that Persian civilization somehow has never died out. And what is Persian civilization? It is, in Herodotus's words, what a Persian boy was taught to do when he was very little. He was taught to do two things. One, ride a horse. And two, never tell a lie. I think the latter has come down to us as Parsis as well. And Persian civilization which continues in these few hands, I don't believe will ever die out. In fact, there is a great resurgence now. And the resurgence happens to be among the Kurds. We are told today that the Kurds who are the, the uh, persons targeted by persons like the Islamic group, etc., 
are en masse turning back to what they call the good religion of their ancestors. So I believe that even though these great empires have vanished in history, and mind you, they've spanned 1100 years, if you look at all three of them, Persian civilization will continue to live on. And that civilization should teach this troubled world at least two things. One, to stick by the path of truth because there is no other. And the other is to be non-violent at all times. Thank you all very much.